how you going? Welcome to York Street. We hope and pray that this sermon will be encouraging and fulfill your spiritual needs that you have during this season. So grab a cover, your Bible, and a comfy seat, and let's get into it. Hello. Good morning. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Bree. I'm the youth pastor here at York Street, and it's my privilege to get to bring you our message this morning from the Word. Um, many of you will have been here last week and um, had the privilege of hearing Anthony share about the gospel, um, the good news, what good news that is. Um, you will have also been able to get one of our reading plans for our new series on Romans. So if you weren't here and you haven't got one of those, it's okay. We're only the second week in. You can still jump on board. I actually um, caught up a whole bunch at once, so it's okay. That's fine. Um, But there is a reading plan on here that you can follow along through the book of Romans with us as a church and as a community. Um, Such a powerful book the book of Romans as well. And Anthony shared last week about how powerful that has been in shaping um, our faith and our faith traditions as, um, as Christians here at York Street. And I think, yeah, it has the power to change lives. So don't miss out. It's going to be great. Um, So as I said, you heard Anthony speak on the gospel last week. Cool message. Um, Next week, Spoiler alert, you're going to get to hear Tim speak about salvation, another cool message. So sandwiched in the middle there this week, I'm going to talk about sin. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> Um, So the title of this message this week is called Fallen Short. Um, And if you are following along with us, along our reading plan, you will notice that coming out as a bit of a theme in this set of readings through Romans this week. You'll notice that Paul is kind of, yeah, he's he's hitting some home truths and... um, so I wanted to add some context to that because he's not just trying to be a Debbie Downer. There's, there's a point to it all. So um, before we start, I would like to do a little exercise together. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. Nothing weird's going to happen, I promise. <laughs> I'll get you to close your eyes. And I want you to picture in your minds, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to do this. Um, I want you to picture somebody you think of as really holy or righteous. Someone who, um, you know, they might be someone inspirational, such as, you know, someone who has such a close walk with the Lord. Maybe it's a grandparent or a pastor or a mentor. Just hold that person in your mind for a moment. And we're going to turn and picture something else now. This time I want you to picture someone in your mind, and it might not be a real person, it might just be a bit of a caricature, but in your mind I want you to picture someone really unholy, really sinful. What are they wearing? Where might they have been? I want you to picture what it looks like. And you can open your eyes, and I'm not going to ask anyone to raise their hands at this point, but what I'm wondering is, how many people, when you were asked to picture someone sinful, how many people pictured someone else? And I wonder, and I don't want you to raise your hands, (laughs) but I wonder if anyone pictured themselves If you have your Bibles with you, I would like to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 20 to 24. And we read, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to those to which the law and the prophets testify. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Now, I've brought props as well. I'm the youth pastor. I'm usually dealing with like teenagers. We like to make it a little bit interactive. So I've brought props. This is, this is not Coke and it's not my morning coffee. So I'm going to mess with the camera operators. I'm sorry. But I'm just going to come down here. Who have we got close? Meg, my first victim. <laughs> have a nice sniff of that. Have a really good whiff. Get, yeah, suck it right up there. Mmm. <laughs> It's good, isn't it? What about Beck? What do you reckon about that? Yeah, ew. (laughs) Crystal, (laughs) have a smell. I wonder if anyone recognises this smell. I'm curious. Mm. Paul's already leaning away from me. (laughs) Do you guys recognise this smell? Yeah? It's it's pretty revolting. I um, I actually had it sitting next to me before the 9am service. And it was making me feel sick, so I had to move it away from myself. So now that I've done that little demo, I'm just going to... No, I'm not. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Someone said scarlet. (laughs) No, no, no. (laughs) Um, It's it's pretty gross. And you can tell just by smelling it that you you do do not want to drink that. Um, But there is someone in my house who begs me to buy that, and I always have some on hand, and that's Zara, my, or our, eight-year-old daughter. She loves that stuff, especially at, say, two o'clock in the morning when she's just beside herself coughing, and she calls out, she's like, Mom, I need some of that cough mixture. It's Seneca and ammonia for anyone who has ever experienced that. Um, you, won't, you wouldn't forget it. If, if you have, you know. Um, it's not like the normal cough mixtures that are all sweetened with sugar. It's the real deal. And I don't know, it, it's amazing. I don't know if your body is just too scared to cough again, but... <laughs> It works like a dream, and Zara knows it. (laughs) And so she can knock that stuff back like no one's business in a way that's equally impressive and terrifying, but only when she's sick and only when she needs it. And so the illustration that I'm trying to make here is that I would have a really hard time getting someone who doesn't need cough mixture, who is well, or who at least thinks they're well, to drink that. (laughs) I have a hard time drinking it, even when I know I'm sick and I know I need it. I still have a hard time drinking it. But, yes, it reminds me of when Jesus said that it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And I would just add a little bit more to that in the context of what um, Paul is writing in this letter to the Romans. It's it's also the... um, when you don't know you're sick, you know, when you don't think you're sick, are you going to seek out that? So, (laughs) so the context that Paul is writing this letter to the Romans in today that we're looking at, it's a church that's a combination of Jewish Christians who had been walking with the Lord, walking with the God of Israel for a long time now. They'd been living out the sacrificial system and trying their best to adhere to all the laws of Moses already for generations. And we have the new Christians, the Gentile Christians, who were not from a Jewish background, and um, they're all trying to live together and work out how best to do life and how best to do church in unity. And so Paul's writing to a group of people, some of whom kind of think they don't need salvation quite as much as these other people. Um, And so we're reading these scriptures, we're all reading it along together as a community at the moment. And as we're reading them, we can be tempted to feel like Paul is just, you know, you're dirty, you're 
sinful, you're depraved, you're disgusting. And it feels, it doesn't feel nice to read these scriptures. There's a huge amount of conviction in these scriptures. But it doesn't feel nice and warm and fuzzy. We like to feel encouraged here at church. It doesn't feel like we, we would like it to feel. But um, we want to take the context of why Paul is writing these things. Paul, what Paul realises about his audience and what can remain true for us today sometimes is that nobody wants to drink this if they're not sick or if they don't realise that they are. If we don't understand the weight of our sin, the weight of our affliction, we'll never truly understand the weight of what we've been set free from. And what a gift it is to not be bound to that anymore. So I don't want to preach a sermon today about sin that leaves us feeling shameful and hopeless and weighed down by our guilt. Because we like to go there sometimes as humans, I feel. We like to sit in that sometimes and carry our shame around with us. Find it hard to let it go sometimes. But let me tell you this. Jesus did not go to the cross. He did not go through all of that so that we could sit in the corner and feel sorry for ourselves and too ashamed to step into the calling and the purpose that God has placed on our lives. So please hear me. This message isn't about guilt and shame, but it is about sin. Because I think it's important for us to understand the gravity of the problem of sin because that will then relate to the gravity of our gratitude. Think of it like this. If I were to shout you a cup of coffee, that'd be pretty nice of me. You'd think, cheers, Brie, thanks. You'd think, she's pretty cool. (laughs) Might have coffee with her again. Um, (laughs) But imagine if I paid off your mortgage and (laughs) all your hex debt and credit cards or after pays? What if I set up trusts for your children and your children's children and their children so that they would all be set for life? The two things don't even compare, do they? And I think because one situation illustrates a circumstance where you, you could have shouted your own coffee. It was cool of me to do that, but you could have done it for yourself. And the other situation illustrates circumstances where you would never probably even begin to imagine earning that or achieving that or being able to, yeah, even dream of it for yourself. And the gratitude would be on a whole nother level. In biblical times, they called this a ransom. So when someone had found themselves in such deep debt, in such a situation where they owed money to lots of people and, you know, the the debt collectors were knocking on the door and they had nowhere else to go, when people would find themselves in that kind of situation and they had no other choice, they would often head to the market square and they would sell themselves as a slave. And someone with the means would come along and could choose to pay off all their debts to settle that score, but they would now own you as a slave. Or, if they were merciful, they could choose to set you free to go about your life as well, having paid the ransom price. So what Paul is trying to get across to his audience is that sin is more than just doing some things and restraining from other things, but that it affects us all in a way that puts our own redemption far beyond anything that we could ever seek to achieve on our own, in our own strength. He's saying that it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from, all are affected by sin and are in need of salvation through Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Jesus is the only way. So I think it's important for us to understand sin. 
because it is more than just behaving well. So I want to have a brief summary. Um, And I'm going to say that God is so infinitely holy and righteous and good. He's perfect. And he created us in his image. And he designed us to live in community with one another and in relationship with him in a place of leadership and stewardship over the rest of creation, the animal, the earth, etc. And in Genesis, we remember that after God created everything, including human beings in his image, he said, it says, sorry, God saw all that he had created and it was very good. Yes, us, good. And I think we feel this. We feel that that's what we're created for. We, when we share those special moments in community, we feel it. And when you get out into nature and you experience just that wonder of creation, you feel it. And sometimes when you're um, in your Christian walk with the Lord, if you've been blessed to experience one of those moments of deep, deep intimacy with God, you feel it. When we're walking and serving, when we're walking in our calling and our giftings, doing exactly what God created us to do, we feel that. So I feel like our hearts know what they were created for. But because of the fall, which is the moment that Adam and Eve decided that they knew better than God and fell for the temptation of the evil one in the Garden of Eden, when they ate from the fruit that God had forbidden them to eat from. Something crept into the hearts of humankind. And we can look around this world and see that something has gone very wrong at some point. Humankind no longer reflected the good and perfect, holy image of God because we were tainted with greed and selfishness and a thirst for power. I've heard it described as being like one of those shopping trolleys and not one of the good ones when you get the dodgy one and it just like keeps like veering off to the side. It's like human beings were naturally inclined to just always pull towards sin. It was in our nature and it separates us from God. So Paul is painting the picture for the Romans here that, guys, we're all in this together. No one is more special or more righteous. Um, This thing affects all of us. But the Jewish Christians, because they were more practiced at the old sacrificial system, they knew all the laws of Moses, the Ten Commandments, those things, um, they kind of thought that they'd earned themselves halfway there. Like, maybe they only needed a little bit of Jesus' blood compared to all those sinful people. And it feels to me a little bit like that coffee cup gratitude. You know? It's not quite... They they don't get the weight of it. See, it's not about forcing ourselves to behave a certain way and then patting ourselves on the back for it. It's not about closing our eyes and gritting our teeth and just trying to get through to death with doing as few sins as possible. That's exhausting. And that's not at all what Christ died for. So let's have a look at Romans chapter 5, verse 19. It says, For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners... So also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. And that's Jesus. So just as through the original sin, we were all tainted with sin. We are all made righteous through Jesus Christ if we choose to accept that gift. When we choose to join with Christ and put our hope and faith in him, accepting him as our Lord and Saviour, he clothes us in his righteousness. His blood washes us clean from sin. He pays the ransom price, whatever metaphor you prefer. (laughs) But a spiritual exchange has occurred and we are no longer that shopping trolley with the bung wheel. 
I mean, we're still works in progress. But we no longer are spiritually enslaved to sin. We can take up our new nature in Christ. And we see this symbolised through when we go through the waters of baptism. So what does that look like? Because, oh, I know (laughs) that it's not always that simple, right? Like I said, we're still works in progress. And no one knew that struggle better than Paul. In uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 15, Paul writes, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. So he identifies with that struggle of, you know, desiring God and desiring more of God, but, but knowing that we're still living in the here and now. Um, but have a look at verse 25. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He recognises that it's through Jesus that we are set free. And like I said, it's not about conforming ourselves to outward good behaviour. We remember Romans 320, when it said it's not through, therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight through the works of the law. Rather, the law, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So in our gratitude, we lean into Jesus. So instead of spending all our energy trying and fighting behaviour, We need to spend that energy chasing after God and chasing after Jesus. And as we draw into his love and experience his grace, it flows that the old ways of living just lose their allure. Sin becomes more repelling to us. As our inner hearts are transformed by growing in closeness to God, our outward actions will be affected. We begin to want to serve the Lord with our lives and make all he has done for us known. We want nothing more than for our lives to point to him and his glory. But what does that look like practically? Because as Christians, even though we're not tied to spin, to spin, to sin spiritually anymore... We're not immune to the whispers of the enemy. He wants nothing more than to ensnare us in that trap again. So accountability is everything. The enemy loves to work in the darkness, where things are hidden, where we keep things secret. Because in that place, his voice gets the best airplay. Because we don't have people speaking the truth into our lives of our identity in Jesus Christ. So if there's something that you struggle with that keeps creeping up on you, find accountability. The Bible says two are better than one and iron sharpens iron. So bring it out into the open and tell someone, the right someone, a trusted someone, And preferably not someone who struggles with the same thing. That can get messy. But bring it out into the light. I've also found the same goes for fear and anxiety. Bring it into the light. If it's possible, remove temptations. We need to physically set ourselves up for success. Get those substances out of the house. Remove some of those apps off our phones. Maybe we need to rethink certain relationships or friendships in our life. And I want to speak with complete experience when I say that sometimes we need to recognise certain people are dragging you under and it's not selfish or unchristian to choose to save yourself from that. 
So while we're removing temptations, gosh, I don't know how many times I talk to someone and when we're talking about, you know, stumbling or stuffing up, we say, well, why did you do that? And the answer will be, well, because I was bored. I don't know. I was just bored. So let's remove that as well. Get into serving God, sharing Christ, fellowshipping with other believers. What we feed grows, right? So choose to spend your time doing things that feed your spirit and help you grow in your relationship with God. Have a plan for when you get bored that involves something that's going to feed your new nature, not your old one. What we feed grows. So to conclude, I think that there are two ways that we can fall into the trap of being just like this Roman church that Paul was writing to and completely missing the point when it comes to sin. And I think both of them, it comes down to the difference between salvation and sanctification. Salvation being the moment we say yes to Jesus, the moment that we realize we're so in need of his forgiveness and his righteousness that we repent or turn away from our old life and accept him as our Lord and Savior. This is salvation, the moment that we're set right before God and we're saved. Tim will unpack this a little bit more next week. But sanctification is the journey of a life being transformed, the journey of us piece by piece shedding the old and putting on the new. It's a life spent pursuing Jesus and becoming more like him. So the two issues I think Paul is clearing up here is one, people who think they're so sanctified that they diminish their need for salvation. I'm not that bad. At least I'm not like those sinners. (laughs) That diminishes our need for salvation. Or two, people who are caught up on how impossible sanctification feels, that they feel unworthy of salvation or unworthy of stepping into that relationship with God. So as we're reading through these scriptures this week, don't be discouraged by them. Don't be discouraged by the weight of sin because it's taken care of on the cross, but understanding the weight of sin adds to the weight of how incredible the work that was done on the cross actually is. And we don't want to take away from that incredible work that God did on the cross. So we don't want to sweep the sin under the carpet either. So as we read the scriptures, let's allow it to convict our hearts this week as we dwell in them. Let's allow Holy Spirit to show us the places that our hearts could be realigned, where our perspectives could be skewed. And let's sit in the gravity of what Christ has done for us by defeating sin on the cross and allow us to to leave us in complete awe of God's goodness and his mercy and his grace. Join with me as we pray. Father God, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you saw the gravity of the problem of sin and you set about making it right. We thank you so much for your goodness and your righteousness, your holiness. And we thank you that um, we we can be a part of that by joining with Christ and um, we thank you so much for everything that was done on the cross. And God, this week as we sit with these scriptures, I just pray that, that you would reveal a new part of yourself to us, that, that we would feel a new part of your heart connecting with ours. And God, I just pray that as we spend more time in your word, that you would, you would not leave us unchanged that we would be convicted, that we would grow, 
and that we would feel closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching this sermon. We hope and pray that you are able to receive something from God during this time. If you are interested in having a look at our sermon-based studies, please visit our website at www.yorkstreet.com.au or check the description below for a link. And if you enjoyed the video, please share, like and subscribe to keep updated. And as you go out, have a blessed and joyous week. God bless.